Okay. Um, so as I say, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the public talk by Professor Diana Taylor. My name is Pilar Riaño Alcalá and I am a professor at the Social Justice Institute at the University of British Columbia. But before I, we be I begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded, ancestral and traditional territory of the Maskian people. This is the first talk of the Social Justice Institute 2021-2022 noted scholar series entangled knowledges, practices of dreaming, reflecting, relating, and being present. This interdisciplinary series aimed to future scholars' critical ideas and creative work at the radical edges of scholarly, artistic, and activist work. We aim to foster critical and creative dialogues on current questions, theoretical and methodological approaches and practice interventions around social justice. This year, the series focuses on broader questions related to social justice and epistemic justice. It is my great honor to introduce today, Professor Diana Taylor, whose talk is entitled Performance, Memory, Repair, Reflections on the Politics of Pandemics. Diana Taylor, and I'm trying to get into my next slide, sorry. Diana Taylor is University Professor of Performance Studies and Spanish at New York University. Many of you know her very well and her work. She's the award-winning author of multiple books, among them Theater of Crisis, Disappearing Acts, The Archive and the Repertoire, um, performance and presenting the political presence and co-editor of Holy Terrors, Stages of Conflict and Lecturas Avanzadas, the performance, among others. Taylor was the founding director of the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics from 1998 to 2020. She's the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and several other major awards. In 2017, Diana was president of the Modern Language Association. In 2018, she was inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Science. And in 2021, she was awarded the Edwin Booth Award for, and I quote, outstanding contributions to the New York theater community and to promote integration of professional and academic theater. End of quote. Diana talks is co-sponsored today by the Department of Theater and Film, the Dean of Arts Office, Latin American Studies, and the Transformative Memory Network at UBC. Many friends, Diana. My gratitude to professors Olivia Gagnon, Alexandra Santos, Geisha Beril, and Erin Baines for their enthusiasm in crafting this collaboration. So Diana will speak for approximately 40 minutes, and then we will have time for questions and answers. Uh, Professor Olivia Gagnon will moderate this part. You are welcome to formulate your questions via chat or at the end in person. Diana, aquí estamos. Presentes. <laughs> welcome. Gracias. Bueno, thank you. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be with you. And I especially, of course, want to thank um, Pilar and Olivia and everybody else who made my visit, I wish it were more of a visit uh, with you today possible. So today I'm going to talk about reparative memory and there are a few people I think in the world who know more about reparative memory than Pilar. So <clears throat> the uh, conversation hopefully will be very interesting, maybe not just today, but in the time to come. So I am going to share my screen and show you a few images I have for you. Uh, let me just see here if I can do this. I know I can, I know I can. Um, I don't know why this changes now, hold up. Let's see. Um, 
I'm sorry, I don't know why this, the, I don't know, hold on. This I can do, I know I can. Um, da -da. Well, I'm just gonna have to show it to you like this. Okay, so Francis Yates begins his 1966 study, The Art of Memory, by drawing from Cicero's telling of the nobleman Scopus of Thessaly, who hired the poet Simonides of Sios to sing in his honor at a banquet he was hosting for his relatives. Scopus derides the poet for also praising the gods Castor and Pollux and demands that the gods pay half of the poet's fee. Soon afterwards, a messenger comes into the banquet hall and informs Simonides the two men are waiting to see him outside. When the poet goes out, the roof of the banquet hall crashes down, quote, crushing Scopus himself and his relations underneath the ruins. And quote, the corpses are mangled beyond recognition. Simonides identifies the bodies by remembering exactly where every person was sitting. Friends and family members are then able to bury their dead. From this, Cicero concluded that the poet invented the art of memory because, quote, he realized that orderly arrangement is essential for good memory. Nothing more about trauma. Yet this tale shows the art of memory is born of trauma and in a sense involves retribution and enables repair. Cicero's invest investment in relating it lies in signaling out the techniques of memory, which he categorized as, quote, one of the five parts of rhetoric by describing, again, quote, the mnemonics of place and images. His example demonstrates how Simonides had trained his memory, an essential skill for a poet in the oral tradition, to, quote, select places and form mental images of things so that the order of the places will preserve the order of the things. Cicero's account only incidentally points to how memory can help repair the effects of traumatic loss. The family's ability to give their dead a proper burial is fundamental to the process of mourning and healing as we know from examples from all over the world, from Sophocles' Antigone to the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, to the families of indigenous children killed in Canadian residential schools, those of the 43 disappeared students in Mexico, and relatives of people dying alone from COVID-19 around the world today, to name a few. Cicero also remained silent as to the repercussions, remained silent as to the repercussions of the violence inflicted on Scopus and his relations. Did family or community groups seek to investigate the cause of the collapse or clamor for accountability or even retribution? We know from the examples I just named that loss and grief extend beyond familial groups to communities and nations who continue to struggle to identify victims of state, judicial and social violence, to acknowledge the damage, engage in acts of repair and at times demand retribution to heal. Nestled in the Simonides story, however, there is a sly reference to accountability, justice, and retribution. The two strangers outside, Castor and Pollux, who beckon the poet to safety, bring down the house on the blasphemous Scopus and his guests as payback for the insult. But then what? Identifying the dead and burying them, crucial though that is, is not always enough. Who is accountable for this loss? In the case of Scopus, we might say that the annihilation was an act of God, literally. Even here though, that would only be partially true because Castor was mortal while his twin Pollux was immortal. The act of God, a term that commonly refers to devastating events beyond human intention or control, was not only very much within divine and human control, but calculated to inflict maximum hard harm on the offending Scopus and his relations. Similarly, the devastation caused by floods, famine, disease, mass migration, and extinctions are hardly acts of God. Neither are the millions of deaths caused by poverty, lack of adequate food, shelter, or healthcare. 
Neither are those caused by the global pandemic that we're experiencing now. This story, albeit tangentially, points to the cynicism behind efforts to evade accountability by deflecting responsibility and appealing to higher powers. When, while Cicero's account sidesteps the implications and consequences of the disaster that lies at the center of his story and on which his argument concerning the invention of the art of memory depends, it is clear that trauma affects those beyond the victims it annihilated outright into the future and at times for generations to come. Cicero's understanding of memory, as Joseph Farrell observed, is relatively as a relatively simple faculty for storing and retrieving information differs from the understanding of memory that many have today, unless we think of computer memory. Our hard drives are quite separate and independent from the materials they contain and make available to us. But even here, Cicero's conceptualization of memory is telling. Memory for him was critical to Simonides, a well-known professional poet of the oral tradition. It allowed him to flawlessly perform the work. As Pharaoh notes, Romans in particular were to a large extent in the habit, not of storing memories, but of performing them. Recitation, recounting, acting out as fundamental performance modes also underlying non-Western forms. Popol Vuh, the sacred book of the Mayakiche people begins, great is its performance and its account of the completion and germination of all the sky and earth, its four corners and its four sides. The term performance, Beochi, refers to the hiring of persons to perform the text. The translator and editor, Alan J. Christensen argues, as applicable to the Maya as to the ancient Romans. Embedded in the Simonides story, ostensibly limited to the arts of memory, lie several of the elements of memory, trauma, accountability, repair, and performance that I will address today as reparative memory. By performance, I refer to the several dimensions of trauma that can, be, that can be understood only as and is performance in Richard Schechner's terms. Trauma expresses itself by, uh, viscerally through bodily symptoms, reenactments, flashbacks, nightmares, and other forms of repeats expressed in the here and now. Trauma like performance is always in situ. No matter when the violence occurred, the, the physical reactions are experienced in the present. The fact that we cannot neatly separate post-traumatic stress from trauma points the centrality of the reiterated effects that constitute the condition. Schechner's definition of performance as twice behaved behavior and never for the first time holds equally for trauma. Trauma is never for the first time. Trauma too is known by the nature of its repeats. Not all blows or wounds create trauma, just those that produce the characteristic aftershock. Not everyone who has been in combat or raped, abused or neglected suffers from incapacitating trauma. The nature and frequency of the exposure, the age of the person when the violence happened, their individual resilience and support systems help explain the variations. So too with communities and societies. Not all who suffer soul crushing discrimination, massacres, displacement, incarcerations, environmental disasters and so on respond the same way. But traumatic blows continue to haunt our present and shake the individual and social uh, body. As I have written about trauma and performance elsewhere, the question is not just what trauma is, etymologically, a blow or wound, but what it does, how it takes over our bodies, conscious and unconscious, individual and collective. To speak of traumatic memory then, is to recognize that loss and trauma are not separate from the medium, that is memory, that holds and transmits them. Trauma literally lives in the body, it can change the neurohormonal regulatory systems, 
cortisol, adrenaline, the immune system, and through the um, and through the epigenetic controls that allow genes to express themselves. These can get switched. These switches that regulate our levels of arousal, our fight, flight, or freeze responses, and so on, can be permanently turned on. Trauma grips and deregulates our entire bodies and can be transmitted through generations. It gets transmitted in many ways beyond the epigenetic, growing up with the silences, the shame, the anger of those who have survived. Children and even grandchildren of survivors can experience depression, anxiety, lack of trust, heightened reactivity and restlessness, among other symptoms. So can members of scorned societies. Rather than coterminous with memory, as in the Simonides story, we might say that trauma holds memory hostage, freezing it in time and place, impeding it from adapting or being integrated into everyday life. Because of their emotional intensity, traumatic memories inscribe far more forcefully in our bodies than ordinary memories and last far longer. Memory, impede, uh, memory imprints on us not as an insensible wax writing tablet, as Cicero put it, but in our living flesh and psyche. Violated individuals might dissociate from their bodies and block the conscious awareness of what happened to reduce the threat to their existence. A child cannot admit being abused or hurt by the relative or teacher or priest who is supposed to protect them. It's safer to blame oneself or forget. The mind suppresses the knowledge and the memory. Scholars who argue that traumatic memory is oxymoronic, that we cannot speak of memories we cannot recall, fo focus exclusively on the conscious mind and forget the body. But, to, uh, but as Bezel van der Kolk argues, the body keeps the score, the title of his book. Traumatic memory is inaccessible, Freud argued, except through repetition. Quote, the patient does not remember anything of what he has forgotten or repressed, but acts it out. He reproduces it, not as memory, but as action. He repeats it without knowing, of course, that he is repeating it. The greater the resistance, the more extensively will acting out, repetition, replace remembering. remembering. Traumatic events, von der Kolt stresses, are almost impossible to put into words. But the body remembers and performs them. Yet neither of these survival mechanisms, encapsulating the painful core away from the conscious self or acting it out, can in themselves be called reparative. As van der Kolk puts it, while Freud argues that the compulsion to repeat leads to uh, mastery over trauma, quote, there is no evidence for that theory. Repetition leads only to further pain and self-hatred. Then, um, end quote, these then are survival, not reparative strategies. Well, some of these examples of traumatic memory refer to the individual experience of trauma, collectivities ranging from the familial to communities to societies more broadly, can also be held hostage to traumatic injuries that have not been acknowledged or repaired. The grandmothers, mothers, and children of the disappeared, for example, are all victims of trauma, having suffered the devastating and uncertain loss of their loved ones. Argentinian state-sponsored terror targeted the general, general population by the very visible tool of disappearance. The genealogical link points the, to the intergenerational effects of traumatic injury. But the entire society was forced into complicity by looking away, what someplace else I call percepticide, or justifying the violence. The saying back then was, they must have done something. Algo habrán hecho to deserve this. They suffer the long-term effects of traumatic violence, whether they immediately understand it or not. So the grandmothers, the mothers of the plaza, however, found a reparative strategy to channel their loss into productive social action, a process that in turn helped relieve their pain and jumpstart a collective social justice movement, 
week after week from 1977 to the present, to this week, the Madres walk and now they drive around the Plaza de Mayo wearing their white scarves and holding the overblown photographs of their children. Repetition, yes, but with awareness, adaptability and change. They place their loved ones, their grief and their demands for return alive, aparición con vida in full view. Traumatic memory consciously turned outward as demand for justice becomes reparative, a political act. Memory for them was a doing or is a doing. When they ask what we do, the abuela say, we can respond, we remember. They remembered by creating exhibitions, running DNA banks to identify their missing children taken in cap captivity. They march with the mothers, the children and other human rights groups. Connecting with others, pain can become less paralyzing, transformed instead into an in engine for social change. Rather than shut us down, a collective acknowledgement of quote, loss of acknowledgement um, of loss has made, as Judith Butler says, quote, a tenuous we of us all. Theater and performance artists throughout the Americas have put trauma, memory, and social justice at the center of calls for accountability and repair. Well, there are several extraordinary examples. I'll just quickly cite two solo pieces by Grupo Cultural Yashkani, whose most important theater and performance group from the early 2000s, as the country's brutal civil war that killed 70,000 people and displaced 500,000 or more drew to an end. <coughs> In Antigua, 2008, I mean, sorry, 2000, um, Yuashkani allows passive witnesses of atrocity to come to terms with their past. The tragic struggle of Antigua, staged as a one woman show by Teresa Rally, we learn at the end, is being told by Ismini the sister who could not find the courage to help Antigone, Antigone bury their brother. She chose instead to say and do nothing. At the end of the play, she owns up to her identity and expresses a devastating sense of self-hatred and complicity. She says she enacts the disgrace of others, and I quote, because they are my own disgrace. I am the sister bound in fear. Relatedly, she assumes her role in the drama, symbolically burying her brother and apologizing to them both for her cowardice. Quote, tell him I am greatly punished. I am tortured and embarrassed every day as I remember your deed. This is an extraordinary rewriting and reworking of Antigone in many ways, not least because it enacts reparative change. The characters trapped in Sophocles' script can change the ending. It allows those who are frozen by terror and tormented by a sense of complicity to acknowledge and take reparative action rather than act out the trauma. It's crucial for traumatized people to unfreeze to unstick, to understand, as van der Kolb puts it, that then was then and now is now. Nonetheless, here the reparative dimension remains on an individual level specific to Ismini. In Rosa Cuchillo, also by Yuashkani, actor Ana Correa plays an indigenous woman who searches the earth and the underworld looking for her son disappeared during Peru's dirty war. Rosa wanders from town to town, gathering townspeople, telling them of her loss, so common in the area. This piece was staged in the context of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, 2002-2003, with which Uyaskani was close, closely involved. Townspeople were then encouraged to tell their stories to help the commission create the public record of what they had endured and lost. The public acknowledgement of the violence directed at indigenous people became central to the national commitment to help repair and pay retribution to the devastated individuals and communities. 
Uresh County, like many artists, needed to assess how to engage most productively in the national trauma by using the tools they had, their theater and performance practice. Clearly, given the dimension of the crisis, there was little they could realistically do to confront the violence. Quote, nothing you can create on stage can compare what is compared to what is happening in this country. End quote, Miguel Rubio, the group's director said, but they had to do something. That commitment to do what we can when it seems that nothing can be done and doing nothing is not an option has also been central to my work and the theme that runs throughout my new book, Presente. But that was last year at the very beginning of COVID. So now what? Currently, some close friends and I have embarked on a reparative memory project, the zip code memory project, which we write seeks to find reparative ways to memorialize the devastating losses resulting from the coronavirus pandemic, while also acknowledging its radically differential effects, effects on different upper New York City neighborhoods. Built on the Lenape land, the zip codes that house uh, larger Black, Latinx, and undocumented populations have suffered far greater losses of sustenance, health, jobs, education, and of course, life. The discrepancies in death rates, according to zip codes, let me just show you this map. This is the life expectancy of that area, according to zip codes. And this is not a recent map. The discrepancies in death rates, according to zip codes, nine years, if you look at just on this one subway line, nine stops on the subway line, nine years of difference in life expectancy. Far predates COVID. Predictably, however, twice as many people have died from the pandemic than in nearby affluent neighborhoods. Traumatic stressors in these communities have been massive, long lasting and accumulative, the product of racial violence. The pandemic exacerbated existing inequalities. As in the Decameron, those who could afford to leave the city fled to shelter in safer and at times luxurious places. Essential workers then as now were forced to take care of the dead and dying until they too died. The sick died alone. No one could accompany or mourn their dead. People had to make impossible choices between risking their lives in frontline jobs or not having enough money to feed their families. Kids were trapped, in, in, uh, were trapped as schools, special programs, sports, everything shut down. The US government added considerable insult to injury. For example, they released COVID positive people held in uh, deportation centers and prisons so they could go home and infect their families. Premeditated murder by COVID. Trump was both an amplifier and an accelerant who spewed confusion and flamed the crisis. As one headline noted, quote, the coronavirus was an emergency until Trump found out who was dying. The fact that the devastation was a political decision, not an act of God, only makes it worse. Quote, like silent rage, Arto writes, the most terrible plague is the one that does not reveal its symptoms. Western medicine has been slow and grossly inadequate in understanding or dealing with trauma. First denying its existence, then limiting it to war injuries and classifying it as a rare and exceptional condition. While the evidence of abuse across the domestic and political arenas often based on gender, race, age, disabilities, and other socially constructed vulnerabilities has been staggering. Van der Kolk calls it a hidden epidemic. Preferred medical treatments currently focus on suppressing systems through pharmacological approaches. However, communities have long turned to rituals, dancing, chanting, meditation, yoga, and other practices to help people heal. Modern psychiatry is only now beginning to accept more holistic, non-pharmacological-based therapies. 
So our project, the Zip Code Memory Project, is community-based, opening a space for people to gather and create something together. We've combined our art and theater practices with broad-based theoretical and holistic understandings of trauma and body memory and asks artists and ask artists to propose workshops open to participants conceived as co-creators from four neighborhoods. So these are all um, the upper part of, so it's Harlem, East Harlem, West Harlem, Washington Heights, and the South Bronx. Uh, so the workshops are rehearsal for change workshops based on Augusto Bois' Theater of the Oppressed, um, memory walks, body mapping, postal art projects, um, writing, photo, storytelling, drawing workshops, and creative engagements with people in spaces in the neighborhoods. At the end, we will all create something together which will be performed or exhibited at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. That's the scaffolding for the project. Whatever comes of the process will depend on all the co-creators of the project. While we don't yet have a fully formulated theory undergirding the project, Boise Image Theater offers us a blueprint. Image Theater outlines three, a critical three-part path to get from here to there. Although was here and there, moving from oppression to revolution differs, of course, from ours. The three steps consist of one, acknowledgement of the actual situation, two, envision the desired or ideal outcome, and three, rehearse the transitional process, figuring out how to move forward. That, of course, is the hard work. Participant forms, form groups, and without saying a word, create images with their bodies to enact each of these three stages. After everyone in the group has seen all the images, they discuss the possible best outcomes for what they have seen. Can this oppressive or painful trajectory have a different life-affirming ending? This three-part exercise helps us move through traumatic to reparative memory in a playful, non-therapeutic setting. Wall was influenced by Pablo, Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed, but as important, he knew of the psychiatrist Jacobo Moreno's theory of psychodrama based on the reparative power of creativity and spontaneity in a group environment of trust and love. In psychodrama, participants acted out scenes from their lives, asking fellow workshop members to take on roles switch perspectives, and look for life-affirming solutions. While a theater director, not a psychiatrist, took these uh, psychotherapeutic techniques into the political. His objective was to empower rather than to heal. No longer will we be passive spectators of social ills that befall us, he proposes. We will be spect actors and rehearse and carry forward the changes we want to make. This simple one, two, three methodology helps me personally think about how to solve almost all problems. But it's so simple, even a child uses it intuitively. As proof, scientific proof, um, I am offering uh, an image that my four-year-old granddaughter Shoshana drew last week to express her process from sad to happy. She needed to navigate through a maze, which fortunately for her was supported by love and play. The name quote for reparative process is love. Eve Kofosky Sedgwick reminds us, quoting Melanie Klein. Sedgwick rereads Klein's paranoid versus reparative positions as reparative critical practice that is, as ethical possibility, the promise of an open-ended that embraces the elements of surprise, empathy, care, love, and that includes self-care. The qualities of love, play, and care prove vital for us in our reparative arts project. 
trust building exercises taken from psychodrama, theater of the oppressed, theater training, and so forth, enable us to overcome the boundaries between us. We follow each other, take turns leading each other in exercises in which we give up our agencies to another. The fun and ridiculous bodily positions we need to take during the exercise it make it easier to talk about even the most serious events. How can I be distant and critical from someone who held me up or whose ear was recently on my stomach or whose eyes I've looked into for an excruciating long three minutes? The spontaneous and playful nature of the exercises creates with what Jacques Lecoq termed complicité, a joyful feeling that, we all, that we're all in this together, a subtle sense of belonging, even solidarity, that serves as a powerful antidote to feelings of shame and complicity for participating, however unwillingly, in oppressive and traumatic situations. We learn to sustain and support each other. Through rehearsal, we bring a new community of practitioners into being. These reparative practices encourage us to communicate through embodied action to acknowledge body memory. Words, as psychotherapists from Freud to van der Kolk agree, do not capture traumatic experience, which needs to be processed in and through our bodies and only eventually turn into a story or a narrative. Silent communication helps partic participants in these initial stages, gestures, movement, facial and bodily expressions, sounds, all capture and reveal dimensions that our language leaves out. They allow us to recognize and break down the habitual body postures created by hard labor or pain or stress or inactivity. By not allowing us to resort to language and by playfully engaging us in novel bodily positions, these exercises allow us to recognize what Jacques Rancière called the distribution of the sensible. Quote, a priori distribution of positions and capacities and incapacities attached to those positions. Boyle puts it this way, quote, the exercises are designed to undo the muscular structures of the participants. Take them apart to study and analyze them, to raise them to the level of consciousness so that each person understands, sees, and feels to what point his and her body is governed by their work. So he has these exercises, you know, if you're sitting down at the desk all day, if you're a laborer and so forth. Undoing, becoming unstuck, and shifting positions might also be a way of thinking of Rancière's notion of emancipation, which begins, he says, when we, quote, challenge the opposition between viewing and acting, the spectator also acts. She participates in the performance by refashioning it in her own way. The one, two, three breakdown into stages helps us acknowledge and get past the actual situation. We move from the pain of the eternal traumatic now to the past tense, then, the first, not the last stage of our process. We can visualize ideal outcomes. We can articulate and discuss how to get there. Having gone through rehearsals for change, participants move to the body memory mapping workshops. Participants help each other trace their body silhouettes onto butcher paper. Then everyone begins to locate their memories, their pain, their hopes, their joy. Where do these live in our bodies? People can add photos or drawings or objects, anything they feel further illustrates how and where and why their bodies feel as they do. Everyone displays the body maps and looks at them individually and together to share and what they see and feel in them. The next day, the group moves through the spaces in their neighborhoods, attaching memories and feelings to spaces. Unlike Cicero, remember him? Who valued memory because he could help the orator track the order of places and images. Here bodies remember in and through space and images. Being there in place, people often resuscitate buried memories that can express through language and other gestures. They can remake space, reimagine it, and reclaim it in creativity 
and joy. And joy. The final workshops focusing on photo, writing, storytelling, so forth, allow participants to more fully delve into the community and into and communicate their memories of the past, the pain of the present, their imaginings for the future. How can they rewrite the damaging narratives? So here too, as in Antigone, they can claim agency, change the ending and create stories that enable us to live. This is an image uh, created by Elena Clement um, in a workshop that we did with indigenous women in Chiapas 10 years ago. It also demonstrates the one, two, three structure that encourages participants to acknowledge the actual and the desired situations through art. So here's the person drawing, and this is what she's imagining, and this is what she needs to get there, right? Her writing implements. And these are people who don't talk to each other, right? This is not anybody who's sharing a theory. They come up to it uh, on their own. Various people have imagined large uh, community-wide events during the Zip Code Memory Project. One idea was to plant a garden in late November or December. While not much can grow in Upper Manhattan or the South Bronx during that time of year, some came up with the idea of creating flowers. Everyone who wants to can make flowers, paper flowers, felt, wire, every kind, color and shape and imaginable, and then all together take them to the place where everyone agrees to plant the garden. Each flower could have a name or a photo or a story. Perhaps we could even plant it in conjunction with planting or helping these uh, mutual aid groups that are planting their community gardens. Those are some ideas. Part of the fun is coming up with ideas. Our final workshops after the public programming has ended um, will be a series of train the trainers workshops. Those who have enjoyed the process, feel that they've benefited from it and want to learn it can then learn it and use it in their own ways. Our community-based discussions until now have taken place weekly on Zoom. We have another one tonight. Well, we have accepted over half of the participants. We haven't yet begun our workshops. Our first one is going to be on Saturday. But we recognize the discriminatory, pra discriminatory practices being played out in this seemingly eternal now, not just of the pandemic, but of brutal discrimination in the US, Canada, and elsewhere. We are all beginning to discuss what we imagine as ideal or best outcomes, not just for the zip code memory project, but for those hardest hit by the ongoing violence. Who in the end will be held accountable for the excess deaths caused by racism, misinformation and neglect? In time, I hope the co-creators will formulate their own version of the actual ideal and transitional images. But the process is an ongoing communal one. It involves all of us who have lived in it in whatever capacity, the Ismanis as well as the Antigones. My guess now is we'll find a way forward together or not at all. Thank you.